Now, we're going to start using probability more and more in this class. We need to understand the rules behind probability. Here are five of them. The first one is that any probability is a value between 0 and 1. Probabilities closer to 0 or are unlikely or nearly impossible. Probabilities closer to 1 are certain or very likely. And I encourage you to think about probability as a value between 0 and 1. A probability is not a percent, uh, although it's often easier for our minds to think of events as uh, probabilities in percentage. So probability then allows us to make inference, but how do we assign probabilities? That is, where do they come from? Here are a few ways. First, we can use kind of a classical approach to understanding probability. If we have an experiment and it has n outcomes, we can assign a probability of 1 over n to each outcome. So these are examples include, what is the probability we flip two coins and get two heads? What is the probability we roll a dice and get two sixes? These are examples where we know what the outcomes must be, and so we can use probability in this classical approach to assign what those values are. You could also use a relative frequency approach. And here it might be harder to think about which outcomes you expect, but we might rely more on historical data or uh, we might design an experiment to say something about those probabilities. As an example, we might have two sets of n experiments, and these might typically result in two different ratios. How might we use notation to denote this? Well, if n sub a is the number of times that event a occurred, n sub a divided by n would be the frequency in which a occurs. So we've looked at this example in class. This is the example with birding. Suppose we make 30 field visits uh, and we record whether or not we see or we hear a golden-winged warbler. This is a bird of special concern in a lot of states across the United States. So if we find them, we record how many are there. And so when we went out, as it turned out, we went out 18 times and didn't find any birds. And so our probability based on relative frequency then is 0.6. When we went out three times, or when we went out, correct, three times, we saw one bird. The probability here is 0.1. We went out zero times and found two birds. We went out zero times and found three birds. And we went out nine times and found four birds for our probability of 0.3. This is an example of the relative frequency approach to assigning probabilities. Another way is a subjective approach. This is when your probability is based on your intuition, your knowledge, your judgment. Here, the accuracy of the probability depends on the accuracy of the information used to find it. So, uh, what is the probability a deer hunter will harvest a deer? What is the probability Minnesota will see a drought next year? And so these are always uh, subjective approaches for probabilities. So you need to be careful with these, and especially when you hear these reported. Uh, these are not always based on data. Sometimes they make assumptions, sometimes they don't. And sometimes and oftentimes you're dealing with much more uncertain factors in uh, this kind of probability assignment method. And so the second rule of probability is if S is the sample space, that is, the list of all possible outcomes, then the probability you find something in that sample space is 1. Uh, and so if you uh, were to take all the possible outcomes together, they must have a probability of 1. That is, you could sum them. Sometimes it's really helpful to look at uh, pictures of what probabilities might look like. Here's where we'll use Venn diagrams. And so here's an example where we have two disjoint events. So A is an event and B is an event, all within our sample space. On the contrary, uh, two events that are not disjoint, and the event of A and B consists of some overlapping between them. And so here we have, well, A could certainly happen, B could certainly happen, but also A and B can happen. 
An example might be, well, the probability that it rains today is 50%. The probability that a baseball team wins a game today is 40%. What's the probability of both of those occurring? We would say these two probabilities are not disjoint. We'll also talk about probabilities in terms of whether or not they're mutually exclusive. That is, two events are mutually exclusive if it's impossible for both of them to occur within one repetition of an experiment. That is, if one event occurs, the other cannot occur. And so the one figure on the left shows two mutually exclusive events. The figure on the right shows two events that are not mutually exclusive. The third rule of probability, if A and B are disjoint, the probability of A or B is just the sum of both of those probabilities. So in other words, if two events have no outcomes in common, the probability that one or the other occurs is just the sum of all of their individual probabilities. And this is also known as the addition rule. The probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B. Sometimes it's often hard to calculate probabilities of things, but it's sometimes easier to calculate the complement of those probabilities. That is, what are the chances of something not occurring versus something occurring? So we can say the complement of any event A is the event that A does not occur, and we define that as the probability of A with a subscript C. And so to find that complement, we can just take 1 minus the probability of A occurring. And this will be helpful to us, particularly when we deal with lots of probabilities with varying rules. We also need to know whether or not two events are independent. And so the next probability rule is that two events are independent if knowing that one event occurs does not change the probability that the other occurs. So now instead of the addition rule, we'll call this the multiplication rule. That is, the probability of A and B happening is the multiple of probability of A and probability of B. And so really, if two events A and B do not influence each other, and if the knowledge about one doesn't change the probability of the other, we can say that the two events are independent. Conditional probabilities are also really helpful for us. This is oftentimes when we know something occurred before we're calculating the probability of something happening. And so here we can denote that by the probability of A given B. We, you, we say given when we see the pipe symbol in our notation. So then the notation probability of A given B indicates the conditional probability that event A will occur given that event B has already occurred. And so we can calculate that by the probability of A and B happening divided by the probability of B. This conditional probability is really helpful to us particularly when we're talking about multiple events happening. Another way to look at independent events is that if the probability of A given B is the probability of A, or the probability of B given the probability given A has happened is the probability of B, then they're independent. It doesn't matter what the other probability is, so long as the probability of A given B is the probability of A. That's to say, it doesn't matter what happens in B. If you can't say this, then they're dependent. So if the occurrence of one event doesn't change the probability of the occurrence of the other event, the two events are independent. We're going to step through an example now. The University of Minnesota's Plant Disease Clinic has samples from seven red oaks and three bur oaks to test for oak wilt, a tree disease. The Plant Disease Clinic does a lot of testing of oak trees for these different diseases, 
and homeowners and landowners might want to know what kind of disease they have. And so they'll send a sample in and the, the plant disease clinic will analyze it. So the plant disease clinic has these two examples. They're going to select two trees at random and diagnose them. What is the probability that the two trees selected are burr oaks? And so this is a visual way to look at the results. We're also going to calculate the results by hand. Let's start with what we know. Well, we know that the probability of selecting a burr oak is 3 out of 10, or 30%. The probability of selecting a red oak is 7 out of 10. That's kind of the first selection that we'll take. A lab technician is going to grab one sample first. Well, whatever they select for the second sample is going to depend on what they selected on the first sample. And so here, the probability of selecting a burr, given a burr has already selected, is 2 over 9. And they could get a red the next time. The probability of getting a red, given the first sample they collected was a burr, is 7 over 9. And so you can draw one of these tree diagrams when you start talking about conditional probabilities. And it's often helpful for you to make sense of the probabilities and how to calculate them. And so here we can calculate, well, the probability of getting two burr oaks is 3 over 10 divided by 2 over 9, or 0 0.0667. You can see that that's the least likely combination uh, compared to the other probabilities of 0 0.23, 0 0.23, and 0.47. And so that's an example of how we might think about visualizing different probabilities. We'll also do a calculation where we calculate what these values are based on some of the formulas for conditional probability that we just discussed.